Welcome Westview to another exciting Sunday. We welcome you as we continue with the Live for a Change sermon series. Please enjoy it as we continue with the journey. Good morning. Um, as you know, winter is fast approaching and we are appealing for baby blankets and nursery school blankets for the Shekhu. The babies, we make beanies, booties, and have blankets, which we make up in a packet to give out at the clinic. Um, any baby blanket will be appreciated. It can be knitted, it can be crocheted, it can be bought. There are a lot of babies that are being born and in the winter being in those shacks, it's very, very cold. At the nursery school, we've got 90 preschool children who also live in the shacks and also get very, very cold. What we normally do, we buy fleecy and then we make blankets, which are one and a half meters by one and a half meters. Any donations would be appreciated. You can drop off any items at the church or put it into the church's banking account with a heading of the Shekha blankets. Thank you very much. Greetings, friends and family in and of the faith. Uh, allow me to greet you in that powerful, profound and precious name of our resurrected Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, especially during this Easter season in which we celebrate but also work out the implications and the meaning of Christ's resurrection for our everyday lives. And so friends, as we come into this space and this place, we remember that we primarily come here to worship God, to glorify God, to honour God with all that we are and with all that we have. And so as we prepare our hearts to do that, I want to invite you to work through the liturgy of the call to worship. Once again, the words that appear in yellow or in bold up on your screen, I'm going to invite you to read together with me as we respond to an adapted reading of Psalm 16. And so, let's work through the liturgy together. Keep me safe, O God, for I've come to you for refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for God is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. My body rests in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. And so friends, invite us and we are invited in this moment to come giving our singing, our rejoicing and our praising to God. And so we invite you to join with us in worshipping God in this moment. Say that you're 
worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am. Heavenly Father, you who were, you who are, and you who will forever be. We stand in awe of your power and your creation. We stand in awe of your love and your provision. We thank you for, for your forgiveness. We thank you for your healing. We thank you for your comfort. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you're amongst us every single moment of every single day. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, you came to earth and you humbled yourself. You, you were part of the creation. You, you were there in the beginning. And yet you humbled yourself and you came to earth so that you can pay the price for us so that we can live forever. Yo, that's yo. Thank you, thank you. Just doesn't doesn't do it. But we thank you, and we praise you, and we worship you. Because without you, there's nothing. Without you, we are nothing. Holy Spirit, thanks for being here. Thank you for for this space and this place and this time. Thank you that we can worship you today, and but thank you that we also can, wherever we are in our own in our own spaces and places, that we can meet as a family and that we can have church together. We thank you for the message that we're going to receive today. We pray that that you will open our spiritual eyes and open our spiritual ears and, and bless us. Bless us with your word. Bless us with, with your message. And we want to pray that you continue as we, we carry on with this week, that you will be with us everywhere we go. Let us be a light in this dark place for you. Let us, let us shine the light. Let people see us and and say, yo, I want to I wanna meet their God. I want to, to have what they're having. Lord Jesus, we pray that you forgive us for all the bad things that we do and forgive us for, for not trusting you always. But please don't punish us for that. We thank you for everything because we know everything is from you and everything worked together for your good. Amen. Friends, we continue our time of worship as we come before God with our gifts and our offerings. We, we live in a time um, of, of great uncertainty. I don't know if it's just me, but I sense a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, um, a lot of distrust and a lot of, of questioning of, of things that we've always assumed as being true and solid and, and, and they've been tested. Um, and more so from a financial point of view, uh, the the experts are all warning us to cling to what we've got and don't spend and because there's trouble coming. And it is comforting in a time like this that we can trust in the provider that always provides. Um, I want to invite you to read along 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food 
will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Friends, if we trust God with what he's trusted us with, he will trust us with more and he will never fail us. Where's his bank details are on screen now? You're welcome to use it now or at the end of the service. Have a blessed day. Hi Westview, please pray with me. Dear Lord, may we realize afresh today what your death and resurrection meant for us. Forgiveness, freedom, and the ability to walk with you through this broken world into eternity. May we always find our satisfaction in you and your willingness to offer yourself to us. Lord, we bring to you our tithes today as our offering and sacrifice for the benefit of your kingdom on earth. Thank you that we may walk in your light and follow your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we are reminded that it is a tradition and a practice here at Westview uh, in which we have the privilege but also the opportunity of handing the family cross to either an individual, a family or a small community group in which we are committed, in which we promise to pray for them in their needs, their obstacles and their challenges. This week our family cross is going to Don and Ntima Temba and so shall we pray for them as we bring their concerns, their needs but also their challenges to the throne of God's grace. Shall we pray? Lord, in this moment, we pray for both Don and Ntima Temba. Lord, both of whom are struggling with their health and with their bodily function in this moment, specifically their eyes. We pray specifically for Don who has lost just about all of his eyesight. And so Lord, in that moment and in that instance and in that circumstance, they are unable to come to church to worship together with us, to enjoy the fellowship that you have provided, but also to be a part of a community. And so, Lord, we pray in this moment that even though we are separated by space, that we are still united in spirit. We pray that they would know and that they would be reassured and assured that they belong to this community, even if they are not able to be here presently and physically. So Christ, we pray for their healing and their wholeness. May they know that your presence goes before them. And so Lord, in the midst of their struggle with their own eyesight, we pray in this moment for Ntate Don. Lord, may he know that you are the God who will never leave him nor forsake him. Lord, we also pray for Me Ntima. Lord, may they know that you are the God of healing. Mudimu Yari Fudisang and Mudimu Unalibona. And so, Jera, ons bid in hierdie oomlik vir u die teenwoordigheid, vir u kracht en vir u mag en u genade in hulle levens. Lord, we continue to give them over to your care, to your throne of grace, and may they know that your grace is sufficient to carry them and keep them through their distress and through their struggles. Lord, in this moment, we commit them to your comfort, to the leading of your spirit, and ultimately to your presence that goes before them, that resides within them, and that continues to surround them. Father, we pray for these things and we pray for these, your people, in the name of our resurrected Christ, who brings life out of death, who brings hope out of hopelessness, who brings joy out of moments that seem to give us no joy. And so in these things and for these things, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hello, Westview. Our reading is John 20, verse 19 to 23. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the door locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. We thank God for his word.
And so friends, as we continue to journey through this Easter season, we remember that Easter Sunday is not just a day, but it is a season of approximately six weeks in which we reflect on, think about and begin to discern the implications of Christ's resurrection for our own lives, our own world and our own communities. And so in that breath and in that same vein, we continue to work through the sermon series entitled Love for a Change. And ultimately, our theme for this week is the very challenging but also very convicting theme entitled Transformation. In order to underline and underpin just how challenging and convicting it is, I bet you that if we did a public survey, we would recognize that each and every person would choose to live in a world that is peaceful, free of fear, free of fear and a world that is conducive to the flourishing of all human life. And yet, in the midst of our answers that seek a better world, that seeks a more prosperous world, that is open to a more just and equal world, we have sometimes forgotten that in order for the world to change, we have to change as well. The world cannot change if we remain unchanged. And so in the words of the very profound Joseph Campbell, he said the following. He said, we must let go of the life we have planned so as to accept the one that is waiting for us. And oftentimes that means letting go of the self that we know in order to be transformed into the unknown self in the future. Friends, I think I can speak without fear of contradiction and confrontation that transformation and change is one of the most difficult processes and procedures that we as humans have to go through. It means letting go of what we know in order to step into the unknown. It means that we allow our boundaries of comfort to be pushed in order that we can see that other possibilities are available and open to us. On a lighter note, I had a friend who decided that he needed some change and transformation in his life. It was in the era in which we still had voicemail recordings. And so as somebody would phone him and he was unavailable to pick up the, aunt, uh, pick up the phone, he would leave this voicemail. He said, I'm not available right now, but I thank you for caring enough to call. I'm making some changes in my life. Please leave a message after the beep. If I do not return your call, please know that you are one of the changes that I've made. And so I seem to suspect that as easy as it is for my friend on the one hand to make changes and transform his own life, I suspect that there are a handful of us, if not the majority of us, who would choose to rather not go through the painful but also prosperous procedure of change and transformation because it pushes us beyond our breaking point. And so friends, for the theme and for this topic of this day, I want to remind us that Jesus has very specific ways of reaching into our own lives in order to change the things that need to be changed. If you will, look with me at the text. The first thing that I want you to recognize is that Jesus comes after us and comes for us. Now in Christian language, we would call this grace. Grace is the process by which God continues to pursue us in order to proceed, in order to change us into all that God has imagined us to be. It's called grace and it's amazing. Transformation is rooted in the reality of God's grace. And I suspect that many of us are unable to go through the changing and transforming procedure of encountering God's grace because we think transformation is rooted in what we are able to generate. And yet the good news of Resurrection Sunday, the good news of the resurrection of Christ, is that God reminds us that transformation is always founded, rooted and built on God's grace. Now for a very simple definition of grace, it is God's activity in our lives. Faith is our receptivity to God's activity. That is the way that grace has always operated and that is the grace, way that grace will continue to be at work in our lives. But... I also suspect that so few of us are able to discern and decipher just how amazing this grace is because few of us are beginning, few of us are willing to reflect on the way in which God's grace has to contend and compete with some of the things in our lives. Come with me and look at the text. The disciples, the text says, are gathered on the first Sunday, but they are gathered in the evening. That means that darkness surrounds them. Go read in the context of John chapter 20, Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved have gone to the empty tomb. They have witnessed that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is indeed alive. And yet here they still are behind locked doors. 
In other words, there is darkness, there is disbelief, and there are doors that God's grace has to compete and contend with. And yet you know what God's grace does? God's grace destroys our darkness. God's grace dismantles and disrupts our doors. And ultimately, God's grace destroys our disbelief. Think with me for a second. Each and every one of us have encountered some aspect of those three D's in our lives. Darkness, doors and disbelief. Darkness is a current theme that runs throughout John's Gospel and darkness is often associated with hopelessness and the inability to see. And so is there somebody who can testify and witness with me that at some point in life darkness was present in our lives and yet God's grace stepped into our darkness. Now here's the really cool thing. We remember that the Sabbath is the Saturday. The day in between Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The Sabbath is the day in which Jews would rest in order to know that even when they are unproductive, God is still able to produce and provide. And yet here on the first day, the day after Sabbath, the day in which the disciples are meant to be at rest, the day in which disciples are meant to be prepared for the week that lies before them, they sit in darkness. Remember, John's gospel is interwoven and connected with the creation narrative. The creation narrative tells us that on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light in the midst of darkness. And the darkness was dispelled by God's light. And here on the first day of the week, as a disciple sit on the evening in their own darkness, Jesus as the light of the world steps into their darkness, reminding them that their darkness is no obstacle to God's grace. Friends, if you have some darkness in your life, remember that God's grace comes after you and God's grace comes for you to remind you that your darkness is no obstacle to the light of the world who is Jesus Christ himself. But maybe you might not be wrestling with darkness. Maybe you are wrestling with some doors. We remember that these disciples have locked the doors for fear of the Jews. Now the Jews are the same people that Jesus consistently shamed and embarrassed throughout his public ministry. So how is it possible that these disciples who saw Jesus have victory over the Jewish leaders and the Jewish leaders and Jews, how is it possible that now in this moment they fear the same people that Jesus overcame? Friends, sometimes our fears are irrational. And sometimes with irrational fears, we end up building doors and barricades and boundaries between ourselves and other people. And in the process of building walls and doors and barricades and obstacles between ourselves and the things that we fear, we inadvertently separate ourselves from God. But here's the good news of Resurrection Sunday. Here's the good news that Jesus is able not only to walk through our doors, but to come into our midst without us even recognizing. That no matter what door we put in place, Jesus is able to step in to our places of fear and confinement to remind us that His grace will pursue us in order to change us. So Jesus confronts darkness, Jesus dismantles doors, but ultimately Jesus disturbs our disbelief. Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved have seen that the tomb is empty. And yet here on the first day of the week in which they should be going out into the world, proclaiming that Jesus is alive, they instead sit in disbelief because they still can't grasp the reality and the meaning of the resurrection. And so maybe you might not be struggling with darkness or doors, but maybe you've been grappling with disbelief. That yes, you can cognitively assert that Jesus is resurrected, but in your own heart, your own behavior, your own con conduct and character, you are unable to display that Jesus is alive. It is one thing to affirm that Jesus is resurrected. It is something completely different to display that Jesus is alive. And so Jesus in his grace comes after our darkness, our doors and our disbelief. And recognize the first words that Jesus proclaims to these disciples, peace be with you. The first time that Jesus says peace be with you, because he says it twice. The first time he uses it, uses it as a Jewish salutation or greeting. It is a cultural and customary greeting in Jewish culture to say peace be with you. And yet the second time Jesus uh, uh, communicates it to them is after Jesus has shown them the wounds in his hands and in his side. And so in this moment, when Jesus says it the second time, it is not just a greeting, but it is a conveyance of what Jesus has purchased on the cross. Through the wounds of Jesus, we don't just have a greeting of peace, 
But instead now we have peace with the Creator and the Maker of the world. The disciples have joy because they recognize that Jesus has purchased peace for them. Not just giving them peace in greeting, but giving them peace in relationship with God. And here's the powerful and profound point. That Jesus in his resurrected state is able to do different things than his crucified body was able to do. And yet he still bears the scars of his yesterday. Jesus' body has been transformed, but he still bears the scars and the wounds of his crucifixion. And so maybe for those of us who are unable to believe that we are able to be transformed, never forget that you may still be bearing the wounds and the scars of what they did to you yesterday, but Jesus' transformation through his body reminds us that in the midst of our wounds, transformation is still possible. Don't miss this. The wounds of Jesus was the way in which they were able to recognize Jesus. But the resurrected body of Jesus was the way in which Jesus was able to transform them. So your wounds are the way in which people are able to relate with you. But the changing of your life in the midst of your wounds is the way in which other people are able to see that transformation is a possibility for them too. A crucified, resurrected Savior comes to meet us in the midst of our darkness, behind our doors, and even in the midst of our disbelief. Now this is an important word because for some of us, we think our transformation is based on our own commitment, our own confession, and our own character. But Jesus does not need your commitment, your character, and your confession to transform you because His grace is able to break down the barriers of darkness, doors, and ultimately disbelief. The first point, Jesus comes for us and Jesus comes after us. That's grace. But the second point I'd like to make is that not only does Jesus come after us, but Jesus also commissions us. Jesus gives us a mission in the midst of our fear. These are the disciples who feared the Jewish leaders, and yet now Jesus sends them out into the world that they are fearful of. Friends, oftentimes the way in which Jesus confronts us and changes us and transforms us, we would want Jesus to transfer our fears away from us. But the reality of God's good news and grace is that God takes, us, takes our fear and then calls us to confront the fear that we're seated with. These same disciples who fear the Jewish leaders, who lock themselves behind closed doors because of fear of the Jewish leaders, are now sent by the crucified, resurrected Jesus to go and forgive the same people that they are fearful of. Friends, how often is this the case? That not only does Jesus give us peace in His grace, but now in the commission, Jesus gives us purpose. Jesus gives us a mission that needs to be accomplished and that needs to be completed. But here's the interesting thing. Here's the powerful thing. Here's the profound thing about this commissioning that Jesus gives us. Jesus gives us the commission to be dispatchers of good news. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Each and every one of us are sent ones. Because Jesus recognizes the most profound way to be transformed is to live beyond yourself. Jesus recognizes that fear and faith formation cannot breathe the same air. Jesus recognizes that self-preservation and self-transformation cannot breathe the same air. And so friends, I want to remind you of what Richard Raw says. He says, transform people, transform people. We cannot transform the world by God's mission unless we ourselves are being transformed by the mission that we are partaking in and participating in. Friends, Jesus gives us a mission and recognize the way in which he gives it to us. Jesus breathes on them and then gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now remember earlier I said John's gospel is interwoven and connected with the Genesis account of creation. Go read with me, if you will, for your homework, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. It says that God formed the man from the dust or the ground of the earth and then breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and he became a living being. In the same way Jesus, in recreation, breathes the Holy Spirit into his disciples and orders a new creation in which all of his disciples are re-alivened and given new life to perform all that God has created them to do. Recognize this, that Jesus 
in John's Gospel is the only one who is able to breathe out the Spirit on his disciples. In the Genesis account, God alone is the one who is able to breathe the breath of life into humanity, making them spiritually and physically alive. So not only is this a giving of the Spirit, but this is also a proclamation and a claim of Jesus' divinity. Jesus is the only one as the God-man, God in flesh, who is able to give the Spirit of transformation. Why is that important? Because when Jesus commissions us, it reminds us that we are called to look to Jesus alone for the purpose that God has called us into. And maybe for some of us, we have looked for power and purpose beyond the realms of what Jesus is. For some of us, we have looked for purpose and power in our possessions. For some of us, we have looked for a commissioning in our social status. For some of us, we have looked for commissioning even in our religious spheres of influence. When Jesus says, if you want a true mission to move you beyond your fear, to move you beyond yourself, come to me because I am the distributor of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives them the power to do what he has called them to do. Jesus does not just send us on mission, but Jesus commissions us with the power that he alone is able to give. Friends, thirdly, not only does Jesus come after us and come for us, not only does Jesus commission us, but ultimately Jesus also qualifies us. I want you to keep those three things in your mind. In order for us to be transformed, Jesus comes for us, Jesus commissions us, but ultimately Jesus qualifies us. In the first instance, Jesus gives us peace through His grace. In the commissioning, Jesus gives us purpose. But in the qualification, Jesus gives us power. Recognize that Jesus gives them power to do one specific thing. He says, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven, but whoever sins you don't forgive will not be forgiven. Now I want us to be careful and cautious in our translation of that mission and that power. Jesus is not giving us the power and the authority to be arbiter and judge in other people's lives. Jesus is not inviting us to have the moral high point and ground when it comes to other people's sins. Jesus is not inviting us to forgive other people and if we don't forgive them then God doesn't forgive them. What Jesus is setting up here is the very mission and the power to do what God has called us to do. Jesus reminds us that each and every one of us as disciples are arbiters of good news. Each and every one of us have the responsibility and the role of proclaiming the gospel of grace. Jesus reminds us that when we proclaim this gospel of grace, this gospel of peace as Jesus has already proclaimed to the disciples, this gospel of union between humanity and divinity, he's saying when we proclaim that gospel, we make the forgiveness of sins available and possible. But when we refuse to participate in the power that Jesus gives us, we are shutting the world off from receiving the possibility of the forgiveness of their sins. In other words, Jesus is saying, when we don't fulfill the Great Commission, we are ultimately refusing the forgiveness of the world's sins because they are unable to respond to God's grace. Friends, this call that God gives us comes with great responsibility. We are invited to share the gospel and proclaim the gospel of grace so that other people can know their sins forgiven. Now, this is important to recognize because for John, sins is not just some moral law or a list of ethical failures that we commit. For John, sins goes much deeper than the actions or the iniquity that we commit. For John, sins is the inability to see the revelation of God in Jesus. Ultimately, what Jesus is giving us the power to do is to give sight back to the world in order that they can see what God has done through the crucified and resurrected Jesus. John is reminding us that this Jesus, who has been resurrected, is giving us the power through his spirit to remind us and to remind the world that grace is available for every sense of blindness that we face. Jesus reminds us that our call is not to judge people, but to give people the revelation of who God is in the midst of their darkness, in the midst of their shut doors, and in the midst of their disbelief. Jesus comes giving us peace, He comes giving us purpose, and He comes giving us power. Now friends, remember this, that in order for us to transform the world, we have to be recipients of this first. 
That's why Jesus approaches the disciples immediately. Jesus does not go out to the world, but he inevitably confronts and speaks to his disciples first. Because he recognizes that in order for transformation to take place, we have to have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. There's no point in proclaiming that we know Jesus when we haven't encountered Jesus for ourselves. And so friends, as I bring this sermon to a close, I want to leave you with a bit of a poem that I came across. The poem goes as follows. Somebody can take a worthless sheet of paper, a well-known poet, and write a poem on it and make it invaluable. That's called genius. Rockefeller could sign his name on a piece of paper and make it worth millions of dollars. That's called capital. Somebody can take gold, stamp an eagle on it and make it worth millions of dollars. That's called money. A mechanic can take a material that is worthless and transform it into a material that is worthwhile. That's called skill. An artist can take something that is a piece of canvas that is considered, in, that is con considered valueless, paint a picture on it and make it invaluable. That's called art. But ultimately, God can take a sinful life, wash it in the very blood of Jesus, put his spirit in it, and make it a blessing to humanity. That's called salvation. And it is eternally worthwhile and invaluable. So friends, as we come to the resurrected Christ, remember that the call is for our lives to be transformed. Jesus does not come to transfer our fears. He comes to transform them. So friends, as we have heard the word of God, as we have heard the voice of God, may each and every one of us embark on this journey of encountering the Jesus who comes for us, who commissions us, who qualifies us. The Jesus whose grace steps out into our darkness, steps behind our doors, and ultimately dismantles our disbelief. That in the midst of all of this, in coming after us, in commissioning us, and in qualifying us, Christ gives us peace, He gives us purpose, and ultimately He gives us power. Friends, everything has been set up for transformation. All that we have to do is step into the unknown, knowing that the unknown lies in the hands of a known God. Friends, these words I proclaim to you. In the name of the crucified, resurrected, ascended, and one day returning and redeeming Lord, who is our Christ. Amen. And so friends, in our receptivity to the word of God for this day, we recognize that we are not only called to be receptive, but we are also called to be responsive. So as we respond to the Word of God, the message of God, the grace of God, and even the resurrected Christ, I want to invite you just to take a deep breath, become aware of God's presence, become aware of God's power, become aware of God's peace in your life. Then I want you to think about some areas of darkness, areas that you are unable to see clearly, Areas of your lives in which you feel like there is no more progress or forward motion. I want you also to think with me for a second about some doors that you have shut. What are some locked doors behind which you hide for fear of the world? When in actual fact Jesus is calling you out into the world. Thirdly, I want you to think about some areas of disbelief. I'm not just, talking, I'm not just inviting you to think of some areas in which you know about Jesus but areas in which your life needs to be transformed and transfigured by knowing Jesus. As you reflect on those moments of darkness, shut and closed doors, and ultimately of disbelief, I want you to think for a second of the areas in which Jesus has come after you. What are some areas in which you have recognized God's grace pursuing you? In, in, in the midst of all of the boundaries, in the midst of all of the obstacles, where has God consistently and constantly pursued you? Secondly, what is God commissioning you to do? Now that you've been transformed, now that you've encountered this Jesus, what mission, what commission is Christ setting before you? And then lastly, what is Christ qualifying you with? What is the power that Jesus is enabling you with? Is it the Spirit of God? Is it the community of God? Is it the word of God? What is it that God is empowering you with 
in order to fulfill the commission as you've recognized Christ coming after you by His grace. And then, I want you just to be aware of moments in which Christ has given you His peace, a peace that the world cannot give and therefore a peace that the world cannot take. What is the purpose that Christ has set before you? And what power is Christ endowing you with in order to fulfill His mission and commission? Friends, as you think about these things, as deep as they are, as multifaceted as they are, what is the individual and personal way in which God is calling you to respond, to receive, and ultimately to rely on God's grace? I invite you to think, I invite you to reflect, and I invite you to meditate on these thoughts, on these points, and ultimately on this purpose. Praise the hallelujah In the presence of my enemies I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody Praise the hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you gotta hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. So friends, remember that we are not just called to hear a sermon, we are not just called to receive a sermon, but instead we are called to hear the voice of God calling us beyond the confines of our community. And so as we are sent out into the world, remember as Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, now I'm sending you. As we are sent ones, arbiters of good news, carriers of grace, where is God sending you? To whom is God sending you? And why is God sending you? 
as we bring the service to a close and a conclusion, as priests of God Most High, we bless one another, remembering that we continue the work of our Most High Priest, Jesus Christ himself. The blessing will appear up on the screen. And so if you are with family members or friends, just turn to one another, hold each other's hands, and share this blessing with one another. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now, now and forevermore. Amen.